Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Abhi Maris, and uh, I'm ex very excited to be here today. Uh, I am excited to talk to you about managing stakeholders as a product manager. Um, it's, uh, I'm particularly excited about this topic because this is a topic that's not discussed enough in, um, in the product circles, uh, but it is something that we use every day. And it is something that, um, that it's, it's, a, it's a very common aspect in, in our day-to-day -day lives as product managers, but we deal with uh, different kinds of stakeholders, uh, both within the company, outside the company, within our team, across teams, cross-functionally. And it's something that's very, very important. And not enough light has been shed, so I'm very excited to, uh, to talk about this. And uh, hopefully um, you'll enjoy this uh, session and learn something from it. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, making this one. So I hope, uh, I hope you enjoy it as well. Um, so why should you listen to me? Um, well, uh, I am uh, a product manager by trade. Um, I work uh, currently at uh, Amazon. More specifically, I'm a product manager at uh, AWS. And prior to this, uh, I've been at Facebook, uh, more specifically Facebook connectivity. The goal for Facebook connectivity is to bring more people online to a faster internet. So it was at a very exciting uh, uh, few years that I was there um, in working on various different products uh, where we were trying to improve uh, internet speeds and trying to get more people connected to the uh, internet. So it was, uh, it was fun doing that. Prior to that, I was uh, running product for uh, most of the security suite um, at Ruckus Wireless. Uh, Ruckus Wireless is an enterprise um, company uh, basically making uh, enterprise wireless care. Uh, and I was responsible for most of the security portfolio, including some of the federal certifications and such. And prior to that, I was working in a company called Aruba Networks, uh, which uh, is now part of HPE. And uh, I was uh, had a pretty long stint in Aruba where I joined in as an engineer, uh, and I wore multiple hats and transitioned my uh, my way into into product from there. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been a very interesting ride, and uh, I believe the the opportunity to wear multiple hats in different roles in different companies and experiencing different cultures, company cultures, um, was very useful to me in uh, dealing with different um, kinds of situations. And of course, along the way, I have made a lot of mistakes and I have learned a lot uh, from a lot of my mistakes and I've tried to culminate some of my learnings over the years into, into this session. So hopefully it'll be useful uh, for you. So um, a little bit about me, I'm, uh, I'm a huge uh, Marvel and Star Wars fan. Um, so if anyone wants to uh, geek out a little bit on, on some of these, uh, I'd be more than excited to do that. Um, I'm also huge into electric mobility. Um, I have multiple forms or modes of transportation that are, uh, that are electric. And I really enjoy and truly believe that's the future. Um, so I'm very passionate about that. And um, I am a biker. I bike um, quite a bit. I recently did a century ride. Um, it was very exciting and interesting experience. I learned a lot in training up to be able to do 100 miles in a single day. And uh, even the whole uh, journey of uh, getting myself up to shape and actually the day of the event itself was very interesting and exciting. A lot of learning moments within that as well. Uh, I'm also a huge uh, coffee buff. More specifically, I'm a big fan of Cortados. Um, uh, for those of you who are looking at the picture and saying that's just a cappuccino, it's not. It's very different. Um, it's it's uh, it's definitely uh, one of my favorite drinks, especially in the morning. Um, great. So here's how we're gonna divvy up the session. So we're going to talk a little bit of uh, basics first. Let's uh, let's talk about um, uh, some of the basic items of who we are, who we deal with, and what are the typical um, fashions we deal with. And then we're going to divvy up or go get into more strategies, which I think is a more uh, meat of this uh, presentation, if you will. And then uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the things that we need to be mindful of uh, when we are when we are going by our day and dealing with uh, multiple situations and people. So what are the pitfalls to avoid and such? And then uh, we'll get into uh, other topics. So. Um, you know, one of the, one of the interesting uh, things is I wanted to find out what exactly is the official definition of a stakeholder. And this basically, 
interestingly enough captures uh, exactly what uh, what I thought it was and uh, also in our job what it is. Uh, it seems trivial and kind of silly, but I think it's very important to know that when we talk about stakeholders, oftentimes I've seen a lot of people approach it with caution or approach it with, um, you know, how do I get them to do what I want? Um, oftentimes people forget that uh, stakeholders are essentially people with um, the same interest uh, as, as you have in the product and making the product successful. And, um, you know, they, they share your concern and your goal of making something successful. So uh, it's very important to understand that we are all in it to win it. Um, oftentimes um, that approach, uh, at least to me, has made a significant difference because a lot of times I approach stakeholders as, like, how do I get my idea across and convince them and not paying enough attention that, that they have the same end goal as well. So these conversations are actually something that's helping us both. And uh, that is something very important to, to realize that uh, we're, we're one, one big team and, and we have the same end, end goal. Um, especially this is true in a project management or program management world where um, uh, you know, the color schemes are not showing properly, but you know, the x-axis is basically uh, traditionally defined as power of the stakeholders and the y-axis is defined as level of interest uh, that the stakeholder has uh, in your program or project. Um, I'm not a big fan of that um, definition um, of, uh, of traditional thinking. I'm not uh, saying that it's not valid. Uh, I'm just saying as a product manager, everybody's your stakeholder. Um, the only difference is um, basically your stakeholders or the attention you need to pay to the stakeholder changes as you go along uh, the project timeline. Uh, when you're in an ideation phase, um, you're probably spending more time with engineering. You're probably more spending more time with customers trying to understand their pain points. You're probably trying to uh, talk to um, sales to understand um, how to, how would you go to market, you're basically forming a map within your head. And that ideation phase, the kind of stakeholders you spend more time with is very different uh, than, the, uh, than the kind of people that you would spend time during an execution phase. But in execution phase, you want to manage closely uh, the process of uh, producing the product, which is mostly engineering and other functions associated around it. And uh, obviously, as you go to launch, uh, you want to change your um, behavior. You want to spend more time with marketing. You want to spend more time with go-to-market teams. So I, I personally believe that looking at it as a time horizon of a, a program or project or product and changing um, your gears depending on what phase you are in is a lot more uh, uh, easier and a effective method to look at your stakeholders as opposed to looking at it from a traditional uh, project management uh, discipline where you're just looking at giving up people based on uh, based on their power or based on their level of interest. So this has been very useful to me um, and um, I'm hoping uh, this could be useful to you as well. And, and uh, let me know as well if, if this is something that you share. So, you know, one of the things um, that I feel um, is basic to a product management individual is uh, KYS. And if you're wondering what KYS is, it's just know your stuff. Um, there is no uh, excuse to this um, and there's no substitute for it as well. Um, if you wanna run an effective um, program or product, I think it's very important to know your product very, very well. And it's not just the product, you need to know your customer as well. And uh, that will take a long way because as a stakeholder, you need to talk to multiple people. And those multiple people have different levels of understanding of the product, the program and the overall function. And they all have their specialities, but you as a general manager for your function or your product, you gotta have your pulse on the whole organization and that is helping you make this product. So it's very important to know your stuff. 
um, and I had to have very meaningful conversations with your team. Um, unfortunately, no substitute to it, uh, and we kind of put in the work to understand um, our product very, very well. Uh, and something that I would say is, uh, is is the first thing you should start with um, is to understand the product. The um, talking about strategies, one of the strategies that has uh, helped me a lot is um, this concept called concentric circle of influence. Um, as a product manager, you have a lot of people um, that you need to influence and convince, whether it's a brand new idea or if it's a feature that we need to build within a product um, or even changing up how we are positioning a product. Um, or, or whatever that, uh, that whatever you're trying to achieve, there are obviously a lot of stakeholders. And one of the effective ways uh, that I've found, uh, especially when you're dealing with, uh, with uh, a mountainous activity of convincing a lot of people is start um, small, like identify uh, a, a close set of individuals around you that are very important and effective for the program and um, you know, get them on board and then slowly move out. Um, so expand slowly and expand in stages. So first get the feedback of your uh, inner circle first, um, get them on board, um, learn from them, discuss with them, and then do the necessary adjustments and then move to the next stage. And rinse and repeat. So every time you expand your circle, gather feedback, iterate, and then expand again. That way, a couple of things, and uh, it, this one sounds a bit trivial and, and something that mo what everybody would do, but I have been in a lot of situations where somebody took an idea to a very large forum and um, automatically it went in all different directions and it was not very effective. Um, I think ap approaching this in a more strategic way of concentric circles of people, I think is very effective strategy because it helps you to contain your blast radius and also have more meaningful discussions on what would be the right thing to build and who would it build it for and such. So um, I find having this concentric circle approach is very, very effective. Uh, something that I would highly recommend um, as well because it's also an iterative process. And as you go to the next circle, the circles before that are, are completely aligned um, with you. So it's no longer only your objective of convincing the next circle, but all of the circles before that circle uh, is now working for you to, to expand to the next circle. So I think that's a very effective uh, strategy. Think about this as a, in some loose term, a compound interest, right? So every time you go to the next circle, um, your idea has compounded um, to all the circles before it. So that actually is helping you to convince the next circle. So something that's worked out very well for me, um, and I would highly recommend to uh, think about this uh, as a strategy when, when you're looking uh, at launching something or, or trying to uh, take it to a larger audience. The, the other um, aspect um, or strategy is also building a lot of social capital. Um, you know, a little bit of, uh, little bit of social currency goes, um, goes a long way. Um, oftentimes we're so uh, hung up on a particular objective or a particular uh, getting something done that um, we don't, um, build or spend time building that social capital. And I feel that that social capital is very, very important. Um, it's often ignored and it's very easy to push it away. But um, and I think it's very helpful, especially when you are in tricky situations, when you have disagreements with the team, that trust that you build with the team comes a lot of times from the social capital that, that you build over a period. Um, it's not something that can happen overnight. It's something that um, you need to put in the work unconditionally. Um, and, uh, you know, having that, uh, building that trust within the team and building that social capital or currency um, goes a long way in actually getting the work done. So uh, there's a lot more trust. There's a lot more um, belief that, that gets built in. Um, and that makes life very easy, especially when I'm trying to launch um, something new or when we're trying to make decisions along the way. Another um, interesting um, concept that I've, I've found very effective personally for me, and I've learned this uh, the hard way is what I call the 50% rule. Um, you know, if, if you're walking into a meeting 
um, where some decision needs to be made. Um, and if more than 50% of the people are not already aligned with you, uh, there's a very, very high chance that that decision meeting will take weird turns and it can get into a lot of rat holes. And oftentimes we walk out of these kind of um, decision meetings very unsatisfied because the objective was different and the outcome was totally different. Um, that's not to say that those conversations and rat holes are not important. I think they are important. But keep in mind, as a product manager, you're responsible to guide um, the whole team in that room to make the right decision. So one of the things I always do is I make sure at least half of the people in that particular room, of course now it's all virtual, but, but in that uh, metaphysical room uh, are convinced and, and already know about the problem statement, already know about the thought process, already know about the decision we're inclined on. Uh, that actually helps to keep the meeting more focused and uh, for those of you or those of them who are new in, in, the, in the room or to this uh, idea or concept that you're trying to uh, pitch or position, um, I think um, we'll get a lot of guidance and help from the rest of the other half of the room, which already know about this. Um, so definitely something that I would um, recommend you to experiment and play with as well. Um, there's, of course, adds a lot of work because, uh, you know, if you have 10 people in the room, you need to make sure five, more than five of them are already um, convinced or know about it and, and you know they have some sort of awareness in, in the directional directionally where what you're thinking um, it takes a bit of work but it uh, actually avoids a lot of work later on I mean imagine if a meeting could easily rat pull into something else and now you come up with more action items more data to crunch and uh, if you don't even believe that additional data crunching is useful you're just putting in more work that's not uh, that could have been easily avoided so doing some work up front in prepping um, people getting into that uh, meeting is very helpful. And it doesn't always have to be within your immediate team. This could be people from outside the team. This could be um, XFNs. Like make sure you're, you're, you're picking um, people that can help you, um, especially in, in that room. The, um, the other strategy that um, that's, of course, um, uh, has been evergreen is data. And uh, I'm putting this, even though we know a lot about this, I'm still putting it because it's, 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 it's important. Um, and this become more and more important over, over the course of uh, time. Um, always use data to help um, drive stakeholder behavior. Um, oftentimes it's very easy to, you know, people to think about opinions, um, but a lot of times having data, even remotely related, is better than having no data. And this is especially true in uh, some of the non-analytical aspects of um, uh, product building. Think about naming exercises as one where um, a lot of people have opinions, but um, having some sort of data behind it. And then naming is an interesting one because you don't have much data behind naming, uh, but you can always gather data from feedback. Like it could be customer feedback, it could be opinion polls, it could be, um, any sort of feedback that you collect. If you're an enterprise uh, uh, business, it could be from your sales, from your sales engineers. Um, it could be from your existing customers as well. Having some sort of um, data, whether it's feedback, opinions, et cetera, gathered uh, that could help make the decision is, is a very effective strategy. And of course, if you're building, um, um, you know, if, if, if you're building any sort of product which already has some of the data that, that you can already leverage, uh, that is very, very useful. Uh, pricing is another classic example where you got to go with a lot of data. Um, you got to know your competitor's price. You got to know what people are ready to pay. You got to know how much this will impact, uh, whether it's TCO, whether it's uh, if it's a subscription, how much that will impact your customers. I think having that data and guiding the room to make the right decision is, is extremely important. Um, and every time I have gone with data and I've used data to form both my opinions and also guiding the room to make opinions, uh, I think the outcome has been very different uh, and positive as, as opposed to when I've gone into the room with just an opinion. So something that I would highly recommend uh, most of you to, uh, 
uh, to use as well. The other um, strategy, and this might seem obvious, but I think a lot of times we fail to do this, um, is, is oftentimes we don't sell the vision. We're, we're, we're always trying to sell um, uh, an idea, or we're, we're always trying to focus on the very specific thing that we're trying to do, whether it's a feature, whether it's, um, whether it's, it's even if it's a product. We're trying to approach it in a very use case centric way um, but a lot of times we don't sell the broader vision. Um, selling the broader vision actually helps uh, people, especially the stakeholders, as, as um, you would know, to, to think broadly, um, to expand the horizon a little bit more and think about what the end state looks like. And oftentimes it's always easier to know the end vision and work backwards from it as opposed to trying to form um, ideas as we go. So it always helps, especially in tricky situations that um, when you're breaking a new concept or an idea, always sell the vision first. Um, when, when you want um, data science to do something or when you want um, a specific team, cross-functional team to do something, it always helps to first sell them the vision, um, you know, give them an idea of what you're trying to do and then work backwards from it and as to how that particular activity or that particular function fits into the broader vision. That way the, the, the person or the team also feels part of this grand vision. And uh, it seems that it's, there's more to it than just that. Um, it also brings in more perspective. And I think it, it, that's where um, people do give more respect um because of you know you've considered a broader vision and then you're seeing how this particular function or team or uh, individual fits into that broader vision so something that um that we typically don't tend to do and then you know life gets gets on and we we are so laser focused on getting uh, something done we oftentimes forget that we need to sell our vision um more often than uh than, than we do. And uh, sometimes it's very helpful in getting cross-functional alignment and also contribution to the project because uh, everybody wants to be part of something large. And uh, this kind of helps them to understand what's, uh, what's beyond the small effort or work that they're putting in. So there's a few other things um, that, that, that I have um, uh, experienced as well. And uh, trying to kind of run through some of those here. Um, you know, escalations, I'm not a big fan of escalations. I always treat escalation as a lifeline. Um, I rarely use it. I don't know the last time I've escalated something. It, it's often a bad idea if uh, a recipe for disaster. Of course, I totally understand that it needs to be used in certain situations when you're not getting the help that you need and when you've tried different strategies. But I think if you've tried any of these strategies that we talked about till now, escalation is very, very uh, rarely needed. Uh, but you use it extremely, extremely cautiously because um, you don't want to keep in mind, this is your, your, you have other programs and products that you will run. So you want to make sure that you have the trust and support of the whole team with you. So try to avoid that. Um, also try to understand what your stakeholders want. Um, it often helps to do your homework before walking into a meeting, um, especially trying to understand what are their concerns? What would they object to? Um, oftentimes I find that we are so busy convincing our ideas and our concepts that we fail um, to look at the problem from their side. Um, and oftentimes taking a step back, doing our homework, anticipating what their concerns are and addressing that uh, head on um, gives them a lot of comfort. And, and it gives them that comfort that they've thought about it. Like this other person has thought about this idea. This product manager knows my problems and uh, he's proposing a solution uh, to address my problems. And a lot of times you may not have answers to the problems that they may have, uh, to the objections that they may have, but even acknowledging it without, uh, without a solution and then bringing it up front sometimes helps and comforts other people to know that you're thinking about it and it's not that you don't recognize that. So always understand what your stakeholders uh, want, uh, what their priorities are, 
um, to do some homework um, before you get into these situations. Um, and, and I've also seen in many of these review style meetings where uh, people get a lot of feedback. And um, a lot of times people tend to be very livid about some of these feedbacks because they're like, why would the person think about it in this way? And um, try to find the intent behind the feedback. Um, there's always um, different perspectives. There's always different diverse opinions of things. So um, always try to find the intent behind the feedback. And this will especially help the next iteration or the next time you go in front of the same audience where um, understanding the intent and um, taking that head on actually is, is quite helpful. Um, the other aspect also is up leveling and down leveling messaging for your audience. And oftentimes I've seen, um, and this especially happens as product managers in traditional companies where um, if you, if you wanna use certain slide decks or messaging and you just wanna rinse and repeat. Um, oftentimes it's a recipe for disaster. Um, I would say always try to up level and down level messaging, um, whether it's an idea, concept, product, an objective uh, or, or some numbers that you want finance or DS or anybody to run, always up, up level and down level your messaging for your audience. Um, that helps a lot because if they don't, uh, they don't, if they're not able to absorb everything you're trying to say and understand the broader picture, um, it's the outcome's not going to be how you would want it to be. And there are always times when things will go sideways, um, no matter how much you strategize, no matter how much um, you anticipate failure, there will be situations where things will go sideways. And when it does, it's okay. Um, find common ground, um, find out where can you get back with this other person or team or, or member where we can um, find common ground again and then start building from, from there on. And uh, that common ground could also be going back to our strategy, setting the vision, make sure that, uh, um, you know, when things go sideways, go back and realign on the ambition. Like, let's start from, this is what we eventually want to be. This is how uh, this should look like. And then work backwards from there and see where, where, where you're branching and uh, try to address that uh, branch. Um, so that sometimes, a lot of times, has helped me in the past. Next, I want to, also want to talk about company culture. This is something that um, um, I, I believe uh, it's been important to me um, working in different kinds of companies and different styles of operation, looking at different sorts of company cultures. Um, I've seen that, that uh, every company is different. They operate differently um, and embracing that company culture is very important if you're if you take up a new job uh it's important to know how that company works uh then trying to bring in something um so bottom line is don't don't fit a round hole in a square peg so it's it's trying to make sure that that you're flowing uh with the company culture um not to say that um that it's bad to bring in great ideas it's always great to bring in great ideas but if, if you're finding a lot of um, friction, um, reconsider that, like reconsider going back to um, how this company works and see how we can optimize that um, if there is a lot of resistance for fresh ideas. So um, it doesn't mean you should stop, but um, it just means that you need to change the, um, change the approach. Um, one other thing I always see is like, even the title of this uh, session, um, as we originally called it, was managing stakeholders. It's, well, yes, it is, but it's, you know, the, it's not really managing the stakeholders. Um, to me, managing means collaborating with your stakeholders, learning with your stakeholders and building with them. Um, so I think that approach um, also uh, changes quite a bit in, in like how do you work with your stakeholders. So um, I, and I don't think you're trying to force them into doing something um, or you're not trying to convince them to do what you want. We're all together trying to build something that works for our customers, for our users, for our partners. Um, and in the process, doing something great for the, for the company and fulfilling your own career objectives as well. So. Um, so always look at this as a, as a collaborating uh, learning uh, exercise. There are some role specific um, um, uh, items that I've learned as well as I've, I've gone along. 
Um, I'm not trying to make it very long, but just to summarize some of the top four um, roles that product managers typically interact with and, and what are the common pitfalls that, that we do. And, and, and I have done almost all of it uh, that you see on the slide, which is why I made it a point to, to call it out, um, especially with engineering. You know, don't, don't tell them how to build. Um, me, especially transitioning from engineering into product, I've done this mistake a lot of times where, uh, especially initially uh, in my original initial days of product management, where I used to tell engineering how to build it, like it was very, very hard for me to remove my engineering hat and put on my product hat. Um, so always try to stick to the why, like why you want to build it, um, and then let them figure out how to build it. Um, if there are feedback, always provide feedback on, on some of the things, um, but, but don't, don't, uh, don't tell them how to do it. Um, that's what a recipe for disaster. Um, especially with executives, keep it very high level. Um, a lot of times uh, we tend to delve in details because we wanna show that we have thought this through and we, we have all the uh, data we need and like we've done our due diligence and I think that's great. But unless you're asked for, I would keep the details very, very high level when we're talking to executives. Um, and if, if there are questions, of course, dive deep, but don't dive deep um, without being prompted to, and, and keep the focus on the company level. And especially with executives, you wanna paint a picture and a vision of how this um, thing is going to help the larger uh, company. So stick to broader outcomes for the company with this. Um, as opposed to outcome of the product itself. So no, oftentimes for an executive outcome for the product company is far more important than the outcome of a specific product. So something to keep in mind. And, and again, up level and down level messaging based on who the audience is. Uh, and especially when we deal with sales, um, show sales how, uh, how this works, how to sell, like and give them broad guidance uh, and also don't ignore some of the suggestions and feedback you're getting from sales, especially in an enterprise company. Um, this of course might be different if you're in a consumer world, but in an enterprise company, uh, you gotta listen more to sales because there are, there are obviously boots on the ground and, and you get to know exactly what's happening out there in the field. Oftentimes I've gotten rumblings and um, feelings way before things blew up and uh, pay attention to what they're saying. Um, not everything that they say is, is useful, but, but I would definitely recommend it to the due diligence on some of the things that they're suggesting. Um, <clears throat> also with marketing, I would recommend collaborating early. Um, a lot of times product managers make this mistake of collaborating with marketing only at launch. Uh, I feel that it's, a little too late. Uh, I think I would recommend collaborating with marketing a bit early, um, especially as, as we're getting into ideation or, or execution mode. It's probably a good idea to collaborate with marketing just because it helps in getting a better understanding of uh, what this is going to do for a customer and kind of painting that story a little bit more clearly. And it also helps in uh, building more cohesive uh, launch plan. So I would definitely recommend doing that a little bit earlier. And you know, hey, uh, you've done this all, uh, you've tried everything, and there are times when uh, things don't go as planned and things will fail, like you will not be able to convince um, stakeholders or, or, or they fail to see your vision, like it, it always happens. And think about it as a first attempt in learning, like it, there's always um, situations when the outcomes are not as desired, but they're always, always a good learning exercise. So um, keep that in mind and, and don't lose heart because uh, guess what? There will be round two, um, whether it's the same product, another product, same feature, different feature, but there's always gonna be another situation that will manifest soon um, as well. And the learnings here would really help that. And with that, Happy building. Um, I hope uh, I hope you've had uh, fun uh, on the session as much as I had making it. And um, you know, I'm a I'm a, I'm a Steve, true Steve Jobs fan. 
and in the true Steve Jobs style, have one more thing uh, before before we close uh, for today. And then that's uh, you know remember that this is this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and oftentimes, when we are in situations of a particular release or a particular um, feature or a particular um, cycle, we often forget that this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So do keep that in mind. It's, it's a long journey. So um, build great relationships along the way and uh, these relationships will help you and things will smoothen out and it'll get much easier um, as we adopt some of these strategies and also practice because a lot of these strategies are not like an on off switch. It's, it takes practice um, in implementing some of these strategies. And, and, and you know, it's just sometimes it's also the way we think. So keep that in mind and, uh, and good luck with, uh, with, uh, with everything and happy building.